A few months ago, I did a video exploring whether Connecticut's craft breweries were affected by the government shutdown. I thought it went pretty well, but a lot of people pointed out that the beer pouring at the beginning of the video was pretty bad. It's not too surprising that I didn't notice. I much prefer wine over beer. So it's a little disappointing to me that some experts believe young people in the United States may be turning away from wine. According to the Silicon Valley Bank Wine Division, baby boomers, who still lead in total wine purchases, are moving into retirement, adjusting to living on a fixed income and declining in both their numbers and per capita consumption. Millennials aren't yet embracing wine consumption as many have predicted. They attribute this to damaged financial capacity, cannabis legalization, and negative health messages surrounding alcohol. There's a bit of a joke on the internet that millennial purchasing habits are often painted as killing traditional industries. This entails killing everything from lottery tickets to college football attendance to car ads to even hooters, I guess. But even if we dismiss this as clickbaity young shaming, Connecticut does have a growing wine industry, with 26 vineyards currently operating in the state according to Connecticut Wine Trail. Are they worried about these concerns? Are young people killing wine? If you were to be here on a Saturday or a Sunday, well, there would be lots and lots and lots of millennials here. And I think for us, it has to do with creating an experience as much as it had to do with, uh, with the wine. Although I, I, we're very proud of the quality of wine. This is Jim Mason and Michael Connery of Saltwater Farm Vineyards. It's a nifty winery in Stonington that was converted from a former airfield. In fact, they still have the licenses and people are allowed to land small planes on the property. Michael bought the land in 2001 although its roots in agriculture can be traced back to the 1650s. Many people might not think of Connecticut as a wine-producing state, but take a look at the state flag and you'll see three grapevines. According to A History of Connecticut Wine by Eric Lehman and Amy Naraki, wine was a staple of early Connecticut colonies as an alternative to unclean drinking water. That's why it was included on this 1639 seal of Saber Colony. Look familiar? Since then, the industry has gone through many changes, although contemporary Connecticut wineries have been increasing in numbers since the 1980s. Up through the early 80s, there was about a steady of maybe five, and a couple, oh. as Eric said, didn't make it, and then some that, are, that were early on are still around. And then it started to pick up a couple here and there every year, adding maybe one or two. Mm -hmm. And really between, I would say around 2000, um, right around the it turn almost, of the century. almost doubled. Um, and then been adding ever since. Now, when you look at the data coming out of the uh, Napa Valley Bank, they're seeing three trends. They're seeing the millennials are actually upgrading the quality of wine from the two buck chuck, as people refer to it, is basically the lower products to a middle price, uh, middle tier price. The second thing is that they're embracing different ways of accessing wine, so wine in cans has become a millennial concept, so you can get a six pack of wine, as it were. They've also embraced other forms of alcohol, seltzer with, um, with hard alcohol added to it. Jim Malilio of Priam Vineyards in Colchester, as well as James and Michael of Saltwater Farm Vineyards, told me that they have not seen a reduction in the number of young people at their respective wineries, and they're not too worried. But both have taken notice of what young people are looking for. Baby boomers want to come buy three or four bottles of wine, sit out with a group of their friends, talk, maybe bring some food and relax here in the winery behind us. The millennials want to sort of create more of an experience. Yes, they'll do the same thing. They'll come and buy some wine, but they basically are looking also to have an experience. And the other, the other thing we have an advantage here, as opposed to I've noticed some of the vineyards and. California, for example, we have an immediacy of the vines. I mean, people can literally walk with a glass of wine from the tasting room to the vines. We're, we're all of a piece. We do a wine blending class. So we have eight concerts a year here, every Friday in July and August, but we also do a wine and cheese and wine and chocolate, which attracts more baby boomers. Um, also, we're, all, we're going towards alternative ways of doing tastings. So we're going to continue with our wine and raw cookie dough. 
We're looking at doing wine and handmade potato chips. So we're beginning to move towards foods that um, we'll call alternative methods of enjoying wine. People are taking pictures all the time because it's very, you know, not, we're very proud of it. And we've gone out of our way to create a very picturesque, photogenic uh, setting. And uh, yeah, people absolutely take advantage of it. This is not a new concept. Back when I visited the book barn in Niantic, owner Randy White told me the same thing. Young people are not concerned with merely buying a product, but rather are more interested in having a unique experience while they do so. In that case, young people didn't just want to buy a book, but they wanted to experience a unique bookstore as well. At wineries, young people don't just want to drink wine. They want to make a day of it. Some viewers might be thinking that while nice scenery and fun events are great, are Connecticut-made wines really that good? The answers are, of course, subjective, but there are some good reasons to be optimistic about them. Um, the whites, however, are easier to grow and better to grow here than they are in, I, I don't want to say anything bad about California, but the, the whites there get very um, full of sugar, um, and, and they, that's why, and they, they over-oak them then, and you get the, that buttery California white, um, uh -huh. which is not how the Europeans do it at all. And, Ours are much more similar to the, uh, the grapes and the wines you'll get in northern France. And it goes without saying that both establishments told me that they are quite proud of the wine they produce. We'd love to have people come and visit and, and try our wines. I think we make a very high quality, both reds and whites. I think the conventional wisdom is in New England that white wines are better than the reds, but in our experience, our Cabernet Franc uh, is as, as good as anybody's. In the last 12 months, we won the gold medal for Riesling in Berlin, Germany, against the Germans and the French. We also took a silver for our rosé. Our big red, which we take and put it 12 months in French oak and six months in bourbon barrels from Buffalo Trace, that basically took in gold medal in Napa Valley. So the idea that you can't make great wines because you're in Connecticut or you're in Pennsylvania or you're in Virginia, has become pretty much a fallacy.